Good day, everyone. This lecture series is intended to explain the fundamentals of electrical engineering with a specific emphasis on electrical circuit analysis. Okay, uh, and before we begin with the analysis of electrical circuits, it will be necessary to establish a brief background for the study. And uh, this is to enable us to appreciate the philosophy behind the study, which is the development of problem solving skills or abilities in resolving demands that may arise in the engineering discipline. So meaning regardless of your major, be it electrical, mechanical, petroleum, aeronautics, whichever, it is expected that you take this course, likely because uh, it is this so designed to spoil in you the ability to see different sides to solving a problem. And we understand that engineering is the intentional application of science. And coming to electrical engineering, the host of this course, uh, electrical engineering and its subdisciplines, including computer engineering, is the intentional application of Maxwell's equations, okay? So it's equations. Ticks, yeah. Okay. Now we may not go into the details of Maxwell's equations at the stage, largely because of his complexities. But we understand that Maxwell related with Faraday's law of induction, which we'll be talking about shortly in this case, uh, ampere circular law, and the gas law for magnetic field and the gas law for electric field. But to we'll Better appreciate the application of electromagnetic concepts. Electrical engineering, therefore, derived from it the long parameter, or better still, uh, the long circuit ideology or parameter ideology, whichever way we call it. Okay, circuit ideology. Okay. So, in this case, Maxwell's equations in their absolute form do not apply exactly when designating a long circuit element. So, so it means that Maxwell's equations now have to be modified for some obvious reasons that will be mentioned. Okay, let's take for instance. According to Maxwell's law, Maxwell's, uh, Maxwell's equation for Faraday, from Faraday's law, let's say Faraday's law of induction. Here, Maxwell postulated that the time rate of change of the magnetic flux induces a voltage in the path surrounding it. And here, we have something like this, okay? Where this is the electric field and this is the magnetic flux density, okay? This is the magnetic flux density. Then this is the Electric intensity. And this is such that the voltage V is the same as the integral of the electric field intensity. So, in other words, once we are able to establish the electric field intensity, then we can estimate the voltage. And there, 
by rough extension of the Faraday's law of induction, Maxwell said rightly that uh, change in magnetic field, change in magnetic field, because this is changing with respect to time, so change in magnetic field induces a voltage, okay, in the part surrounding it. But for us to now relate, or better still designate, a lump element, uh, we say that, let's put it here, so let's put this here. So, designate a lot element, because in circuit analysis, we are going to be dealing with lot elements, okay? And for Maxwell's laws to hold exactly, we may have to deal with distributed elements. We'll talk about them. You know, but just so, so you so you know, distributed elements. Okay, so we have two form two sides to it. But in circuit analysis, we have to deal with long circuit elements, and we here have, have, have been able to establish that Maxwell's equations do not hold exactly if we must relate with the long circuit ideology, but. All we get to do in electrical engineering derives directly from Maxwell's equations for electromagnetics. So to designate a long element exactly or accurately, the time rate of change of the field must be zero. So it means it doesn't in any way induce a voltage around it. Now, in Maxwell's equation, a voltage is induced in the part surrounding. But for us to designate a long circuit element, there must be no induction. So in other words, it must be zero. That is, the time rate of change of the magnetic field must be zero. And the implication here is that there is no field. There is no field related to one element that could exert influence on another element. So let's take, for instance, a resistor. Okay, this is a resistor R1, another resistor R2. So what we are saying here is that a resistor is a long circuit element largely because it does not have or better still generate any field that by way of extension impacts on, the, on a corresponding element. Okay, so there are no fields related to any long element that could exert any form of influence on the other element. Okay. And secondly, we say that to designate a long element, the time rate of change of charge within the element must be zero. That is, the time rate of change of the charge must be zero. 
And the implication here is that there is no charge builder or depletion inside the element over time. So meaning no charge builder or depletion inside the element over time. And what we mean there is that the total current that goes into the element must be the same amount of current that goes out of the element. So it has no capacity to store it up, okay? So current must flow through it. And finally, on designation of long circuit element, we say that the signal speed through the circuit must be far, far less than the speed of electromagnetic waves. So in other words, the speed through the element must be far, far less than the speed of light. Okay? And should we decide to achieve a comparable speed, then we'll have to resort to distributed elements. The likes of transmission lines, and waveguides. And then Maxwell's equations we hold exactly. Okay, let's move on. Oh, uh, the long circuit parameters, uh, some of which are the resistors, which I have mentioned. We also have the inductors, capacitors, as we'll be naming, you know, uh, as we progress in this course, provides the basis for the development of electrical systems. Okay, let's move on now. So just before we begin uh, with the rigor in resolving circuits, to be good to mention two basic points. So in our study, we have two basic electrical actions observed to contribute to electrical effects in electrical systems. And these two electrical actions can be summarized as first, separation of charge. And the second is charge in motion. So should we have a system where we are able to separate charges, say positive at one end, then negative at another end, here we say at these two terminals, we have voltage, okay? And should we be able to enforce charge in motion, okay? Then we'll say current flows, okay? So take note of this keyword, voltage across and current true, okay? So meaning voltage can only be applied across terminals because it enforces the buildup of charges with different polarities at the terminals, while current has to do with the motion or movement of charges. So these are the two basic electrical actions that um, two electrical electrical actions, okay, that describes every other thing or defines every other thing we're talking about. So electrical circuit analysis therefore entails the description and analysis of the relationship 
between current and voltage. That is current being charge in motion and voltage being separation of charge. Okay. So at this point, it becomes very necessary to talk about the thing that makes voltage and current important, and that is charge. So we say uh, charge is uh, the physical property that causes it to experience a force when placed in an ele electromagnetic field, okay? And an electromagnetic field is a physical field produced by electrically charged objects. So a charge therefore is quantized and it comes in integer multiples of individual small units called elementary charge, okay? Elementary charge. That is, one is positive, positive charge, which is the charge on the proton, and it's estimated as positive, 1.602 times 10 to the power of minus 19 columns. And the second charge is the negative charge, which is the charge on an electron. And it is negative 1.602 times 10 to the power of minus 19 columns. Okay. Now, if charge as it is has been described, so we'll call it Q, okay? Then current being charge in motion, okay, which is charge in motion, is the time rate of change of the charge. So if it is in motion, so at point A, for instance, it moves to point B. So we'll begin to talk about the time it moves from here, point A to point B, say dt. And then we're going to talk about the Q, dt. So that is current, I. So current is the time rate of change of charge, meaning it is charge in motion. And we know that charge is measured, the units of charge is columns, and that of time is seconds. So that gives us ampere. Okay. And since charge is bipolar, then it has a positive charge and a negative version to it, okay? So meaning it is bipolar, charge is bipolar, and it has two polarities, different polarities, two anyway, but then for us to be able to designate current, then we should be able to tell the direction it is moving, okay? Now I just said it's moving from A to B. What if it moves from B to A? So for us to be able to designate current, absolutely, we should be able to, so to designate current, we should be able to define the direction and the magnitude. This is very important, okay? So should we say in a particular system, the current is moving, then we should place an arrow, and then probably it is two ampere or five ampere or whatever it is, two ampere. So it means that R here is positive. Now, this is going to be equivalent 
If the current moves in the opposite direction, when I is now negative 200. So and here you see that to specify this current in a circuit, we must have the direction defined and we must have the magnitude. Else, the analysis becomes very cumbersome and sometimes difficult. So the next important quantity is the voltage. And we have been able to establish that voltage is a separation of charge, right? So meaning one charge of one polarity to build up at one point, say one terminal and charge of, an op of the opposite polarity to build up at the other point. So for this to happen, some work must be done. So work must be done in moving these charges. So hence, voltage is defined as the work done in moving a unit charge from one point to another. So V is the same as the work done in moving a unit charge from one point to another. And this is measured, work is measured in joules and charge in columns. And this gives us volts, okay? And just like we uh, described the proper designation for current, so to designate voltage, to designate voltage, we must tell the polarity, okay? Since charge is bipolar, we must tell the polarity and then the magnitude, okay? So to designate voltage, Correctly, we must tell the magnitude and the polarity. So let's assume we have a resistor this way, R. Then if we must designate the voltage, then we must identify the polarity it's positive negative, and then the magnitude, say V, is equal to, say, positive 4 volts, right? And this is going to be equivalent should we reverse the polarity. Say here it's negative, here it's positive, then this is going to be V is going to be negative 4 volts, meaning here, yeah, current flows in through the positive terminal, and here, current flows in through the negative terminal. Okay, so the magnitude are the same for the direction, the location of the polarity change, that determines the sign. Okay, so in circuit analysis, it is very, very important to note that. In designating the voltage in your circuit, you must specify the polarities and the magnitude, okay? And then we know that power is the rate at which energy is transferred. So it means P is the same as the rate of change of work as you put it. So that is joules. A second, which gives us what? And recall that our current is the time rate of change of charge, okay? And the voltage is the work done in moving the unit charge. So if we substitute them here, then we see that the W, the Q, which is voltage times the Q, the T if the, the Q the Q the Q the Q could cross out gives us the W the T which is power in watts right so this therefore brings us to the conclusion that power 
is the product of the voltage and the current. Okay. So the power associated with any given element is the same as the product of the voltage across the element and the current through that element. So let's say, for instance, we have an element, say a resistor. We have the current flowing through it this way. We know, let's say this is two ampere. So we designated current properly, given the direction and the magnitude, and then the polarity of the voltage of the resistor, say V is two ampere. So in this case, we know that power is the product of the voltage two ampere times the current it comes into the positive terminal two, which is equal to four, positive four watts. Now, should it be that the polarity is reversed, say two ampere, this negative, this is positive, two volts, oh sorry, this is volts. <laughs> two volts, not two ampere, say two volts. Then power will be two volts times negative two ampere. So that's gonna give us uh, negative four watts. Okay. Okay, let us move on. Now that we have been able to establish that in second analysis, we're dealing with long circuit parameters. So how do we model long circuits? So let's say long circuit modeling. So let's assume we have this element this way. These are the terminals, so it's positive, this is negative, so V, so the voltage has been designated properly. And then this is the element, I would say the current is moving in this direction, and this is I. Perfect. So in this case, this is the element, and these are the terminals. So uh, long elements and circuits are modeled such that they have a voltage and an associated current, which may not necessarily be constant. So it means that the relationship between current and voltage may not be constant. Although for resistors, it is constant, giving us the resistance. Okay, so now that we've said this, how do we describe the reference direction chosen for current and voltage in a circuit? Say we have a circuit containing capacitors, inductors, resistors, and all of those, and sources probably to energize the circuit. And we just have it placed right in front of us. So how do we tell the reference direction? How do we tell the direction of current flow? That this is how the current is flowing without all of these signs placing them. Now that we know that voltage must be designated properly by specifying the polarity and the magnitude while current must be specified by designating the direction and the magnitude. But how then do we tell the direction of current flow when no sign is shown, just the elements and the parameters placed. Okay, so we do this by using an established convention. Okay, convention. So in some relevant test books, you'll see passive sign convention, while in some others, you will see associated variable variables convention. So whichever way we, we're talking about the same thing, okay? Talking about the same thing, either passive sign convention or associated variable convention. 
So whichever we're talking about the same thing. It's all about describing the uh, reference direction of current flow. Okay, so let us present them. So we'll say passive sign convention or the associated variable convention. Okay. Okay. So in other words, we already said the uh, current is specified by telling the direction and magnitude, voltage is specified by telling the polarity and magnitude. So, and this is to help determine whether energy is either supplied or absorbed by elements, okay? So we want to tell, we want to tell if energy is either supplied or absorbed by the element. So that's why the convention is important, okay? So let us take uh, a first instance for the convention. First instance, okay? So let's assume we have an element. We don't know what it is. This is the element. We don't know what it is, okay? We don't know what this element is. So this is a terminal here, and this is another terminal here. And we know to designate this properly, we tell the polarities and the magnitude of the voltage. And then for the current, we tell the direction and the magnitude of the current. So if we have this, then from our definition of power, which is the product of the voltage and current, then it means that P is the same as I, V, positive V, yeah? I. So in this case, power is positive. Okay? Now, since power is positive, it means that it is absorbed. So let's say vaguely or loosely speaking, the element receives the power. It adds up, so it's positive. So when you have, when, when uh, let's say you, you're given $1 and you hold on to it, you receive it, right? Now you're only going to lose it, when you give it and it becomes, then it's subtracted, right? But so long you receive it, it's positive, you is added up, okay? That's loosely or vaguely speaking. It's added. Now you added it up. Yeah, it's you know. Now since it is positive, since power, once power is positive, it means that the element absorb the energy. So such an element is called a load. So in other words, any element that absorbs energy is called a load. And usually we call them passive elements. Okay, because they seem not to be making too much contributions, <laughs> loosely speaking anyway. All they just do is to take. They keep taking and taking and taking and, and in, in essence, the world is looking for those that we give, right? That will give to it. And that's by the way, sometimes you have to also take so you could keep. Yeah, so it means it is a load, it's passive, energy is positive. So uh, the element is absorbing energy. Okay, now so power is positive, power, positive power, positive power, therefore, means, means energy 
is absorbed, okay? We just mentioned three points here. So let us look at this convention, okay? Now let us look at the second convention. Let's say we have an element here. Okay, we designate the voltage by specifying the polarities and the magnitude. No, that's similar to what we did before. So let us write the polarities. Okay. So this time, let's say we have negative here, and then we have positive here, and then the current specified by the direction and the magnitude. So in this case, power, the current flowing through the negative terminal. So here we're going to be having a negative V dot I. So in this case, power is negative. Power is negative. And for power to be negative, it means it supplies, it's losing it. Okay, so vaguely speaking, uh, the element is losing its power. So uh, let's say loosely or vaguely, let's say vaguely speaking. The element is losing its power. So it means power here is supplied to the second by the element, okay? So, such an element is called a source. It's called a source, okay? It's called a source. It gives, indeed, you know, and then we call such elements active elements, okay? So we're talking about sources and we're talking about some few examples of passive and, and uh, active elements. The bottom line is we may not be able to cover all the active and passive elements in our study, but don't forget, once the element absorbs, absorbs energy, then it is passive. But should it be that the element supplies energy, then it is active. Take note of these conventions. Meaning for active elements, for active elements, so these are active, let's change the color. These are active elements. Why these are passive elements. So this is the convention. For active elements, the current must flow in through the negative terminal and exit through the positive terminal. Why? For passive elements, the current must flow in through the positive terminal and exit through the negative terminal. Well, oftentimes, I really do not bother so much about where it comes out from. We know we have that charge is bipolar. So if we're able to designate the first polarity intuitively, we should be able to tell the opposite polarity, okay? So just take this as a rule of thumb. For passive elements, the current must flow in through the positive terminal. So we have positive power. Why for active elements, the current must flow in through the negative terminal. And as such, we have negative. I think that's sufficient for now. Okay. Now let us move on to talk about some basic terminologies, okay? Now, uh, now we've provided a, somewhat uh, a little background, okay? The Moda will continue to provide <laughs> Backgrounds, 
<laughs> okay, so but now let us talk about let's review a few terminologies. Okay. So in circuits, a few things we are going to be talking about. So so some terminologies. So let's say some terminologies, terminologies used in circuit analysis. So the first of which is network, we have network. And here we say, this is the interconnection of circuit elements that may or may not contain a close part, a close part. So let's assume we have this element here, this element here, that element here, but this is a network. Now, uh, should we have something like this too? This is also a network. Since we have one close part here, we do not have any close part. Then the next is a circuit. So this is any interconnection between circuit elements, circuit elements with at least one closed part. At least one closed part. And then here we, we could design something like this. Let's say we have something like this. Like that, it's getting too long. Okay. Let's just end it here. So we have about one, two, three, four, five elements. So this is a circuit. In this circuit, we have two close parts. Okay. Then we'll talk about a branch. A branch. So a branch represents a single element, single element in the circuit. Okay, so this is a branch. Okay, this is just a single element. This is a branch. This is another branch. This is another branch. This is another branch. So once you are able to identify the elements in the circuit, then we say those are branches. And branches could be resistors, inductor, even sources, current source, current source, voltage source, and so on. Okay. And then we have a node. A node. Now a node is a point. A node is a point in a circuit. Where point with two or more elements joined together. Joined together. Okay. So in this case, let us check, let us identify the nodes. So, well, here we have two branches, that's two elements joined together, that's a node. Here we have three elements joining together, that is a node. Here we have two elements joining together, that is a node. Here we also have three elements joining together, that is a node. So we have one, two, three, four nodes. So here we have four nodes, okay? And uh, in describing nodes, we talk about essential, that will become very relevant when we 
get to node, node analysis, essential and non-essential nodes, okay? Non-essential nodes. So uh, an essential node is a node joining three or more elements. So essential node is a node joining three or more elements. So here, this is an essential node, okay? It's an essential node, so we have three elements. So when we have three or more elements, then that is an essential node. Then we have a path, okay? So a path uh, is when no node was encountered more than once, okay? So when we are tracing a node, we don't encounter it more than once. So we already have identified one, two, three, four. Okay, so if we want to trace a path, this is a path. So no node is encountered more than once here. No node is encountered more than once here. No node is encountered more than once here. So we have three major parts here. Okay. But should we attempt to go this way, go this way, then this node, we get to meet with this node more than once, and that's not a part, okay. Then we have a loop. Now, a loop is any closed part in a circuit. A loop is any closed part in a circuit. So, in our circuit, this is a loop. This is a loop, and this also is a loop. So in this case, we have three loops, three loops. Okay, so any close part is a loop. Then finally here, we have mesh. So this is a loop that does not contain any other loop, okay? It's a loop that does not contain any other loop. So in other words, if this is loop one, loop two, loop three, now you see that loop Three contains two different loops, so it is not a mesh. So in this case, we have two meshes. So this is this is mesh one. This is mesh two. So the number of mesh here is two. So now that we have talked about some of these basic terminologies I'll be relating with because uh, the mesh, uh, the definition of mesh here will assist with mesh analysis. While for this, the uh, identification of nodes, we assist uh, in uh, when we begin to talk about node analysis. And all of these things uh, will be relating with them. We already know a branch is a single element. So once we're able to identify a branch and then join two branches together, we have a node. Wherever two elements join, it's a node. Okay. And once we have a close part in the network, then that is a circuit. So all of this now brings us into uh, the description of the theory. I call them the three fundamental laws on which circuit analysis is built, okay? We have three fundamental laws such that every other thing, every other theorem, every other principle, any other uh, rule that uh, we, may be, we may end up talking about are based on these three principles. We call them the three foundational principles of 
laws, not laws, the three fundamental laws, the foundational laws of circuit analysis. Um, the first of which is the Ohm's law. Ohm's law. Okay? And it describes, it describes the relationship between current and voltage. Okay, so for our three basic passive elements, let's say for resistor, resistor for instance, Ohm's law provides the relationship. V is the same as IR. Why for a capacitor provides a relationship as I is the same as C dV dt. And for an inductor provides a relationship as V is the same as L di dt. Okay, where C is the capacitance, L is the inductance, and there we have the relationship. So once the direct relationship between current and voltage is established, that is Ohm's law. And this becomes the yastic for our analysis all the way, okay? <laughs> okay, then um, the second law is the Kirchhoff's law, the Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff. Kirchhoff's current law. Okay, we call it KCL, okay? And this is also referred to as the node law, okay? It is the node law. Largely because for a node, different current flows, okay? Okay. And let's assume this is I1, it flows into this node, let's say I2 flows out, let's say I3 flows out, let's say I4 also flows in. And recall, while we're talking about the long elements, the, the, the fundamental or foundational principles in chosen long elements, we said that to designate a long, a long element correctly, that the time rate of change of charge must be zero. That is the Q, the T for that element must be zero, meaning, the current that flows in, current that flows in, must flow out. It does not have the capacity to retain the current. This is, this is Kirchhoff's current law. So it says that the sum of current that flows into the node, into the node, is the same as the current that flows out of that node. So we call it node law, okay? It's a node law, okay? Such that the sum, such that the sum of currents that flow in plus, okay, the currents that flows out, Plus the current that flows out must be zero. Okay? So how do we mean? So here, I1 flows in plus I4 flows in is the same as I2 plus I3. So we can say I1 plus I4 minus I2 minus I3 is equal to zero. This is... Kirchhoff's 
current law. Okay. Meaning the net charge in a node is zero for a lump circuit element. Okay. So here we say the net charge in a node is zero. Okay, and then the third foundational law is the Kirchhoff's voltage law. Kirchhoff's voltage law. Call it KVL. Okay, and this we call it the loop law. Okay, because it says that the sum of voltage drop across all the elements in a loop is the same as zero. So this is a statement of conservation of energy, conservation of energy. Why this is a Kirchhoff's current law is a statement of the conservation of charge conservation of charge. Okay, so it is what mentioned here that these three laws must be at your fingertips because we'll be referring to them at every point in time. Should the analysis of the circuit violates any of these laws, then know that everything has gone wrong. Okay. Let us uh, talk about element law. Element law. Now, this is the voltage current characteristic. Characteristic of a two terminal element. Okay, two terminal. So know that uh, the element law helps in building mathematical models. Okay, this helps helps in building helps in building mathematical models for the circuits, okay? Mathematical models. Why? Because in engineering, well, we relate well with models. Okay, so given a particular model, then we should be able to synthesize the circuit, okay? Or, yeah, so if we want to design a circuit, then we should be able to tell the mathematics or the model that relates these elements in terms of the current and voltage. So that's it, that's what we need to design any given circuit. So the IV characteristics, which is the element law, helps us with that. So in other words, we have something like there's a graph, a graphical representation where we plot the current against the voltage. Okay, this is the origin, zero, okay? So let us consider a few elements based on the element law. Okay, so this element law. So let's talk about the first of it. Let's say resistor. Mm -hmm. So we know that a resistor is a passive element. So since it's a passive element, uh, no, it's not determinants. So we know this is positive here, this is negative here, so that designates the voltage, and then the current flows into the positive terminal, so it's a positive, the passive element, then the current flows in that direction. So according to Ohm's law, so from Ohm's law, we know V is the same as I, R. And then now I is the same as V, over R, which is the same as one over R dot V, okay? Now notice that in analyzing the element law, the voltage equation 
and the current equation must be specified so as to plot the intercept. Should there be intercept? Should there be an intercept? Okay. So in this case, it means that, for instance, let's assume we have uh, uh, voltage, let's assume R is equal to two. Let's just plot with some values. So it means that I is the same as V over two. So if we have a table, for instance, this is V, this is I. So let's say we have minus eight, minus four, minus two, zero, two, four, eight, right? So let's assume we have something like this. So four minus eight divided by two, that's minus four. This will give us minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, four. So I'm sure we can plot this now. So, so if we try to plot this on the so let's try to plot this. So let's assume this is the i axis and this is the v axis. So let's say in v we have two four, eight, right? Then this is minus two, minus four, minus eight. Then for I, we have one, two, then we have four, right? Then here we have one, minus one, minus two, minus four. Right. So at point minus eight, minus two, so we can plot this. So we can plot this. So that's the point here. Minus four, minus two. We can plot this at minus one, minus, minus two, minus one. We can plot this at zero, it is zero. We can plot this. At one, it is two, and plot this at two, it is four, and plot this, then at four, it is eight. So you see, it is a straight line moving through the origin. And then the slope is the same as one over r. So, it means that for a resistor, the IV characteristic is something like this. I, V, okay, the slope is one over R. Okay. You see, here we have been able to design the mathematical model, and then there is no intercept here, so it passes through the origin. Beautiful. And um, we know that one over R is the same as the conductance. This is the conductance, okay? Why this is resistance. And the conductance is in moles. Why this is in ohms, right? Mole, which is also Siemens, right? Siemens, which is S. Um, then if the power as we've established is V, I, then, V dot one over R V, well, that's I, is V squared one over R, right? One over R is G, so it's V squared G. And in a similar vein, V is I R dot I is the same as I squared R, then which is gonna give us I squared over G, mm -hmm. so that's power. Okay. Let us move on to another element, the element law. 
So let's uh, let's say short circuit. Let's say we have a short circuit. Okay, so it's a short circuit, it's just a wire. Okay. So here the direction of current flows this way. Say I, that's that, that has been designated. And for the voltage, we have to identify the polarity and the voltage value. So in this case, by Ohm's law, Ohm's law, V is equal to IR. But for a short circuit, we don't have a resistor. So R is equal to zero. So that means that V is equal to I into bracket zero, which is equal to zero. So we have zero volts. Then for I, I is equal to V over R. R is zero, so V over zero, which gives us infinity. So it means that infinite current flows. So V for a short circuit is zero, and I for a short circuit is infinite. So when we come to this plot, this is I, this is V. So let's assume we want to take on some values of V and I. It says that for all values of I, V is zero, while I is infinite, okay? So it means that I, meaning in this case, V zero for all values. Let's change the color. Zero for all values. Then I extends to infinity. So it's on this axis for a short circuit. So I is equal to infinity. So this is This is the VI characteristic for a short circuit. So how about an open circuit? Open circuit. So we have something like this, then it is open somewhere. So we designate the voltage by specifying the polarity is positive, then the magnitude, then the current with the direction and the magnitude. And here you see that it is open. So it is assumed that for an open circuit, the resistance is the same as air resistance, which is infinite. Okay, that is why we have not all been electrocuted in the world. Okay, it's infinite. So it means that by Ohm's law again, Ohm's law. We have V equal to I R, so which is I times infinity. So it means V is infinite. Why I is the same as V over R, which is V over infinity. No matter how large V may be, so long it is divided by an infinite value, it must definitely reduce to zero. Okay. So approximately, okay. Because the larger we are that we have to share from it, the smaller the amount that we get to each of us. So soon, because the uh, divisor is extremely large, the value approximates to zero for current. Then to plot the IV characteristic, so we can place a chart here. This is V, this is I. So for all values of V being infinite, I is zero, okay, I is zero. So, so once we plot this again, this is I, this is V. And then you see that I is zero for all values. And then the parameter extends on the V axis to infinity. Okay, so that's that. But let's uh, look at a few sources and then move on to something even more important that will lead us into uh, analyzing a few circuits. Okay, 
So let's look at some sources. Uh, okay. Now, an independent voltage source. Say independent voltage source. Element law. So, well, we have it as a circle. And this. So, specified as a VS, that's a voltage with the polarity. And then let's say the current that flows, since it's a source, it's an active element. And for an active element, the current flows in through the negative terminal, right? Remember. So the current direction is something like this. Right. So it flows in through the negative terminal. So this designates a source properly. It's an active element. It's a voltage source, an ideal voltage source. Okay. Now the idea about an ideal voltage source is that it delivers a prescribed voltage. It delivers a prescribed voltage regardless of the current flowing. Okay, so it means that by Ohm's law, V is the same as Vs. Now, whether the current is changing or not, regardless of the amount of current flowing, the voltage value remains constant. And if we try to plot this out, so let's populate a table here, V, I, so we are saying that, let's assume the prescribed voltage is five, okay? We're saying that this is zero, minus one, minus two, one, two. So whether the value of the current is changing for an ideal voltage source, the voltage value remains the same. So if we plot this graph, so this is the current axis, I, this is the voltage axis. So this is one, this is two, this is minus one, this is two, minus two. So this is one, two, three, four, five. So it means that when the current is, okay, let's change the color. Let's make it a little colorful. So when the current is negative two, well, what we get, is five volts. And same thing when it is negative one, what we get is five volts. When it is zero, what we get is five volts. When it is two, what we get is five volts. When it is when it is one rather, when it is two, what we get is five volts. So we see that the IV characteristics is something like this. For an ideal voltage source. Okay, how about an ideal current source? Ideal current source. So we have the symbol, circle, plus minus. So the value of the current, oh sorry, I just put up. <laughs> the designation of a voltage source. So an arrow tells us it is a current source, okay? Yeah. It's a current source. So it is a current source. So if the arrow, the direction already tells us, this is IS, this is a current source. So if this is the direction of the current, then it means this must be the negative terminal, why this would be the positive terminal in designating the voltage, since it, is, since, it is, since it is a source, because the direction of current must be through the negative terminal, okay? Yeah, so with the arrow, they are able to tell the direction, they are we're able to tell the polarity for the voltage in designating it because it is a source. 
And again, and again, for an ideal current source, it delivers a prescribed current regardless of the voltage across the terminals. Okay, so let us put up something here. So by definition, so let's assume this V, this R. Let's assume this delivers four ampere. Okay. Four ampere all the way. That's prescribed. That's why it's an ideal current source. The current value will not vary. Now, let's assume we have varying voltage values zero, minus one, minus two, minus three. One, two, okay, let's put up three, then it's still four. So it means that in plotting our graph, this is the V, this is this is I axis, and this is V axis. So uh, for I axis, we have let's assume this is four, positive four, right? Now we have negative one, negative two, negative three. Positive one, positive two, positive three. So the idea is we are going to get a prescribed current value regardless of the voltage. So at V equal to zero, then that's what we get for. High about minus one, we still get four. At minus two, we still get four ampere. At minus three, we still get four ampere. At Positive one volts, we still get four ampere. At positive two volts, we still get four ampere. At positive positive three volts, we still get four ampere. So we get something like this as the VR characteristic for an ideal current source. So well, we're going to be looking into all of this much later because I is the same as IS it's specified. Okay. Now let us begin uh, with uh, circuit analysis using Ohm's and the Kirchhoff's laws problem. So now let us consider a single loop circuit. A single loop circuit. Which also will lead us to the voltage Divider principle. So let's assume we have a circuit like this. So it stands to some n value. Okay. Well, I have to write that. So we have the voltage source here. Okay. So let us designate a voltage. This is Vs. Okay. Voltage source. Now the current through the source flows from the negative to the positive. So this is going to be the current direction, right? Let's call it IS, because the current from the source. So this is R1, R2, let's say this is Rn. So to designate the voltage values for these elements, positive, negative, V1, positive, negative, V2, because they are passive, they are, they, are, they are passive elements, now that we know current direction, must flow into the positive terminal to Vn. 
Now you see that all of these elements are connected in series, they are connected, you know, in the same loop, okay? So in other words, a single loop circuit provides the idea for parallel, for series connected elements, sorry, series connected elements. So a single loop circuit provides the idea for a series connected connected circuit. So it means that all the elements are in the same loop. So for all elements in the same loop, they are connected in series. Now for all elements having a common node, they are connected in parallel. That's just, just keep it in your fingertips. So let us uh, begin with the analysis of the circuit. Okay. Now, if we apply Kekos voltage law, KVL, around the loop, okay? So we're gonna have something like this. So if we trace from this axis, so the arrow gets into the negative terminal, that is negative Vs, negative Vs, okay, Vs. Then it goes all the way, then this is positive, positive. Remember the sum, the sum of the voltages dropped across each element, of the voltage drop across each element in the loop must be zero. That is Kekos voltage law. So this is going to be plus. I also will tell the voltage V1, right? Plus V1 plus, because the arrow gets into the positive terminal again, V2 plus all the way to plus Vn. And this is support of zero. Then Vn, okay. Now if we move Vs, so we'll say Vs is the same as V1 plus V2 plus all the way to Vn is equal. Okay, that's already moved to Vn, so that's that. So we have our first equation, one. Now by Ohm's law, let's come to Ohm's law. That is V is equal to IR. So we can tell the voltage values by Ohm's law for all of these elements. So it means that V1 is equal to IS because it's the same current that flows. So the same current flows through all of the elements. That is why they are also in series, okay? That's in the loop. Only that the voltage drop across each element will vary depending on the value of the resistor. But the same current flows. V1 will be IS, R1. Then uh, V2 will be IS, Okay, uh, we had a little connection issue there. Sorry for that. So uh, just continue. Okay. Uh, we had uh, connection problems and we're logged out and logged in again. So uh, we'll just take it up again. So uh, okay. 
So we already established for the single loop circuit. Voltage divider. So I just put out the circuit, so take it off from there. Establish the cave here around the loop, which is negative Vs plus V1, V2, V2, Vn. Then Vs is the same as V1 plus V2 all the way to Vn. It's our first equation. Then by Ohm's law, we have been able to establish that E1 is equal to IS R1, IS R2, all the way to IS RN. So that's our second equation. Okay. So if we put two into one, if we put two into one, then what we get is Vs is equal to Is R1 plus Is R2 all the way to Is Rn. And Is is common. So Is into bracket R1 plus R2 plus all the way to Rn. Okay. And from this, we know as Vs, Is will now be the same as V over R1 plus R2 plus all the way to Rn. Okay. So let's just draw it line here. So if the equivalent resistance is the same as the sum of all of the resistances at the denominator plus Rn, then what we have here as Rs will become Rs for the V over the equivalent resistance. So let's say this is our third equation, okay? So the idea is that the equivalent resistance is such that the impact or the characteristic of this circuit must be the same as this, okay? So this is Is and this is Vs. So that is why they are equivalent. Okay, so meaning for a series connected uh, elements in the circuit, the equivalent resistance is the sum of the magnitude of the resistances of each of those elements, okay? Now, to obtain the voltage divider rule, the voltage, obtain the voltage divider, voltage divider rule. rule. We put three into two, that's the three into two. So we know that two is IS, RN, so, That will be two 
This is V1, V2, is equal to this, and Vn is equal to this. So Vn is equal to ISRN, that's what, what we have from two. So if we put in three into it, so Vn will be V over R equivalent, Rn. So if we rearrange this, that is Vn equal to Rn over R equivalent, V. Okay. So in this case, the V we are dealing with is Vs, right? Vs. Vs. So this is the voltage divider rule. Okay, so let us look at one simple circuit where we could use this rule. Okay, so, so let's assume we have circuit with just two elements. So 12 volts, it's positive here, negative. So this um, designate the voltage values, positive, negative, V1, it's positive, negative, V2. Now the current, IS, is flowing. And we don't know the value. So from here, we have two ohms here, and we have four ohms here. Okay, so following the voltage divider rule, for us to be able to resolve V1, so when N is one, so that is V1 equal to R1 over, the arrow equivalent, let's just put it that way for now, then times the voltage Vs. In this case, Vs is given as 12 volts. Now, from this analysis for the equivalent resistance, we, we already explained that for a single loop circuit, means that the elements are connected in series, and for series connected elements, the equivalent resistance is the sum of their magnitude. Excuse me. So this is going to give us R1 over R1 plus R2 Vs. So here we have 2 as V1 over 2 plus 4, which is the same as uh, times V, that's times 12, which will give us, that's 2 over 6 times 12, which will give us 4 volts. The same applies for V2. So for V2, you know, it's R2 divided by R1 plus R2, then Vs, the equivalent resistor. So which will be four volts divided by six, which is two plus four times 12. And that gives us eight volts, okay? Good. Now, we are also meant to calculate for I. Mm -hmm. So by Ohm's law, by Ohm's law, V, Vs is the same as Is, R, in this case, the R equivalent. So this will be equal to V, Vs, equal to Rs, R1 plus, R2. Now R1 plus R2, so that's going to give us Vs is 12 volts, is equal to Is into bracket 2 plus 4. So Is would be 12 divided by 2 plus 4, which is 12 over 6, which gives us 2 ampere. Now let us check by way of, uh, let's say, check. Let's check if what we just did is correct using KVA around this loop. Because we understand now the arrow comes into the negative, so that's negative 12 plus V1, that's plus V1 plus V2, 
plus V2 should be zero. So we have negative 12 plus V1 is four volts plus four plus V2 is eight volts is equal to zero. So that's what it is. And here you see, we're able to apply the KVL and the Ohm's law to resolve the circuit in terms of, now should we have so many resistors connected in series, then you could evoke the voltage divider rule, okay? The voltage divider rule to resolve the individual voltage values applied across each element. So this is R1, R2, this is Rn. So I think that's what it is. So let us look at four elements connected in parallel, having a single node, single node. So single node circuit. And this will lead us to the current divider principle. Okay. So let us look at a circuit. Like say so we have a current source. So here we have R1, R2, and Rn, okay? So tell, and this is Is, okay? So the current flows in to the node. This is the node. So this is single node, right? They're all connected. That's a single node. Means all the elements are connected at a common point, okay? So forget about this distribution. So we could do something like this. There's a node, there's a current source. This R1, this R2, all the way to whatever, uh, then Rn. So we could do it like this. It's still the same circuit, okay? The most important thing is that they have just one common point. So don't be scared when you see some circuits in their complexities. Uh, well, what you should look out for is the node and the loop. And that's it. You could redesign it. Okay. So now, Different current will flow then through each node. Remember, for the node law, where KCL applies the current into the node is the same as the current that flows out of the node. So here, IS is coming into this node. So meaning certain amount of current will flow into each element, okay? We flow into each element. So meaning this will be I1, this will be I2, and this will be IN, okay? And it is interesting to note that the same voltage applies across this element, so V. So this is positive, negative, okay? So it means that this node is at positive polarity and this node is at negative polarity. Just like I explained earlier, so let's assume we have something like this. This is a current source. Then we have a resistor here. We have another resistor here. We have another resistor here. And it's connected here. So it means that at this point we have positive. So at this point we have negative for the voltage applied. That's what we have here. So for ease of analysis, we just have to spread them out. Okay, but this same circuit is equivalent to this circuit. So that is why here, 
We now have to designate the voltage that applies across. So it means at these two nodes, the same voltage applies. So meaning for elements connected in parallel, the same voltage applies across all the elements because they have a common node. Only that different current flows through each element. Okay, let's let's get this up. Let's go. So we can apply KCL. So KCL at the node. That's KCL at this node. So IS flows in as I1 plus I2 plus all the way to plus IN. So this is our first equation. Then by Ohm's law, by Ohm's law, I1, I1 is the same as V, same voltage applies over R1. I2 is the same as V over R2, all the way to IN is the same as V over RN. Okay, so let's say this is our second equation. So if we put, let's put two into one, as this into this, so IS will now become V over R1 plus V over R2, all the way plus V over Rn. And here we see that V is common, so V into bracket one over R1 plus one over R2 plus all the way to plus one over Rn. Okay, this is Rs. So V will be the same as Is over, 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus all the way to 1 over Rn. Okay. So, okay, let us separate this. So from this, you see that 1 over R equivalent will be the same as 1 over R1 plus one over R2 goes all the way to one over R. So meaning this entire circuit is equivalent to a single current source connected to a single resistive resistor. R equivalent. Okay, this is RS, and then this is positive negative V. Okay, so that's it. One over R equivalent. Okay, so the, the equivalent resistance here is one over R equivalent, not one over R, because if it was one over R equivalent, then it means they are series connected. But now that they are parallel, then it is one over R equivalent. Note that the equivalent resistance for elements connected in parallel is one over R equivalent. Okay, so this equation can now be rewritten as V as it is the same as IS over one over R equivalent. This is our third equation. So this brings us to the current divider rule or principle. So if we put three into two, that is, we put this into this, so we have IN is the same as V, V here, V, IN equal to V, over Rn is the same as V times one over Rn, right? Good. So if we substitute for V in this case, then it means that In is the same as Is 
times one over Rn divided by one over R cubed. So if we rewrite this, we see that Rn is equal to one over Rn divided by one over R equivalent times Is. This. Is the formula for current for the current divider principle? Okay. So let us look at one simple example before we we move on. That one simple example, and then so a few examples, I think that'll be it for this class or for this lecture. So let us, uh, okay, let's just rule this over. So we have everything on the same board. Uh, so let's assume we have a circuit like this, very simple one, but could be, could contain more elements. Then we have this, just two elements to explain what we have here. So we have three amp here. So 10 ohms. Then here we have two ohms. Then we have positive, negative here. That's the voltage across the elements. Then here, Designate the current, this is I1. I'll designate the current here as I2. Perfect. So what do we want to figure out here? I want to tell I1, I2, and V. Okay. So by current divider rule, when Rn is one, so we have I1, then one over R1, divided by one over R equivalent times Is, which is three M. Now this will give us this. So here we have one over R1, R1 is 10. So that will be one over 10 divided by, remember one over R equivalent is the same as one over R1 plus one over R2, depending on the number of resistors connected in parallel. So this will give us one over 10 plus one over two, the second resistor, then times three. Okay, so uh, this is going to give us, um, once we resolve this, then we should get, uh, what's the answer here for I1? That'll be 10 times two divided by 12, the one over 10 divided by that. So at the end of the day, we get I1 to be the same as one over 10 divided by 20 over 12 times three. And this will give us one over 10 divided by uh, three over five times three, and that will give us five over 10, which is one over two. So I1 is equal to one over two. Okay. Now, I2 follows directly. I2 will be the same as one, over R2 divided by one over, okay, let's just put it straight. It was one over R1 plus one over R2 times I is right? Yeah, times three. So, 
So this is going to give us I2 as one over two divided by one over 10 plus one over two times three. And this will give us one over two divided by three over five times three. So I2 will give us five over two now. Good. Now to check by let's check by KCL current in is equal to current out. So IS came in, IS is equal to I1 plus I2. So this equivalent to 3 is equal to 1 over 2 plus uh, 5. 5 over 2. So this is 3 is the same as take the LCM here, that is 2. 5 plus 1, that is 6. So this is equivalent to 3 is equal to 3. And that's equivalent to 3 minus 3, that's 0. So many KCL is not violated. So by Ohm's law, by Ohm's law, V V, V here is the same voltage applied across each element. So V is the same as I1, R1 is equal to the same as I2, R2. So let us see if that's true. Let's see if that's true. So I1 is what? One over two times 10. I is equal to I2, I2 is 5 over 2 times uh, R2 times 2. So this, that's 5, is equal to 5. This cross this is equal to 5. So it means that V is equal to 5 volts. So that's simple. So you see, uh, no matter how complex or complicated the second may be, Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's law could be used to resolve the circuit so long you understand the passive sign conventions, knowing that you have to specify the direction of the current and the magnitude for current, and you have to specify the polarity and the magnitude for voltage. Okay, so now that we've done this, in order to solve any circuit using these fundamental laws, let us summarize the basic steps, okay. So, so summary of the basic steps for circuit analysis. So the first thing here is to designate designate the branch current and voltage in the circuit. In a consistent way. Okay. So what I mean here is uh, that you specify current direction, then uh, voltage, polarity, and there. Uh, magnitudes okay and the second thing here is to apply the fundamental laws the fundamental laws that is Ohm's law Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law and you know when we have 
a common node, it's Kekos current law. When we have a common loop, it is Kekos voltage law. So here, for the Kekos current law, we deal with parallel systems. For the Kekos voltage law, we deal with series connected elements, okay? And then the top thing will be to solve the equations for rank variables. That's simple, okay? So let us look at one example. Here we'll follow through the steps to see how it works and then look at a few other examples. Then I think this should be sufficient uh, as an introductory class. Okay, let us put up the circuit. Okay, so we have the circuit. Plus minus. Okay. So here we have eight ohms, four ohms, ten ohms, two ohms. So we have this current source, which is RS. So by designating this, we know this is positive. This is negative because the current flows into the negative terminal for current source. Then this is Vs. Okay. Then we have the current given as 5 ampere. Then we have 70 volts here. So here we want to figure out the S is voltage. That is an interesting circuit. Okay, and here you will notice that the two ohm resistor and the voltage source have a common node. Okay, such that this VS applies across both of them. But the VS does not apply across all others. So let us see, because they don't have common nodes. They don't all have common nodes. So let us analyze this. Um, the first thing to do is to designate the branch currents and voltages. So we want to specify. So you know currents, there's a voltage source. So current definitely flows in the right direction as is specified from negative to the positive. So these are passive elements, so this is positive, this is negative. So let's say I designate this as V1, okay? Then this is positive here, this is negative here. So let's say this is V2, this is positive here, this is negative here, let's say this is V3. Then this is positive, this is negative okay so let's say now we know that this is a common node here this is a common node here this is another node here this is another node here this is a common node here right okay these are nodes so meaning the same current flows here while at this point different current flows here, okay, different current flows here. This is source connected, so the current through the source flows through this, but there is a node largely because two different elements are connected, but they are connected in series. So 
current flows, the same current flows in from flows through from the source to uh, through the eight ohm element. And here we have a node here. So it means that the current flowing through the eight ohm resistor, we have to flow out through two different devices. So it means that the 10 ohm and the eight ohm element are in parallel, but they are in series with the 8 ohm resistor because the total current coming from the 8 ohm resistor will have to split between the 10 ohm and the 4 ohms. And then the current that flows through the 4 ohm resistor comes here and then this node again. So, so in other words, what am I trying to establish here? That the voltage across these two terminals is the same. So if that is Vs as defined, so we call it Vs here, it's the same. Okay, okay. now we have a, a working system. We've done the designation. And now the next thing to do is to apply the fundamental laws, Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's laws, and all of that. So from our analysis and designation, okay, we've not designated the current. So let's say this current that flows here is I1 through V1. And then the current that flows in here is I2. Then the current that flows in through this element is I3. Okay, this I2, I3, why the current that flows in through this element, let's call it I4. Okay, I think we are good now. Designated the current and voltages. And if you could use different colors of ink on your paper when running your analysis, doing your analysis on your paper, that would be very interesting. So things are not modeled on. Okay, so now by by um, KCL, now look at this. Since we have this node and the voltage of interest is Vs, if we could tell I4 multiplied by this resistor two ohms, then we get Vs, we are done. So let us apply KCL for instance to see what will happen, okay? To know what will happen at this point. So that is the sum of currents into the node must be the same as the sum of current out of that node, right? So I3 flows in from the four ohm resistor. I3 is equal to I4 flows out. And then we see that Rs is also flowing in. So we have two current values flowing in. I3 flows in, Rs flows in, sum of current flowing in is equal to I4. Only I4 is flowing out. And this is our first equation here. But you see that we really don't know I3, we only know I1, 5 ampere. We don't know I3, we don't know Is, and we also don't know I4. So the number of unknowns are too many. So we want to look out for an alternative approach. And then in order to do that, we can actually look at for the resolution of I3. How do we estimate I3? For us to be able to estimate I3, then uh, knowing that we have I1, then we could look into the first loop, okay? Such that uh, we could tell I3 and then all the way we go. And what we could apply there, we could apply KVL, okay? So KVL, KVL, right, let's say this is loop one, L1, this is loop two, and this is loop three, right? So KVL at loop one, 
will give us minus 70 from closing to the negative and plus V1. Then it comes again plus V2 is equal to zero. In this case, it's our second equation. So we want to do the same thing. KVL at the second loop, because we need to develop, uh, get the mathematical models and resolve them. So in this loop, here the direction goes into the negative value of V2, so that is minus V2 plus V3. Then it comes all the way to plus Vs. So what is zero? Okay. Good. And now, We could evaluate V1. So let's call this equation three. Now we have two unknowns in equation two. We have three unknowns in equation three. So if we're able to estimate the value of one of them, of the variables here, then we could solve for the other. And we know the current flowing through V1. The current flowing through V1 is five ampere. So with that, through Ohm's law, can estimate for V1. So by Ohm's law, by Ohm's law, V1 is the same as I1 times A, which gives us five times A, which is equal to 40 volts. Okay? So V1 is equal to 40 volts. We have that. So if we put this into equation two, so let's put V1 into equation two, then we have minus 70 plus 40 plus V2 is equal to zero. So that will be minus 30 plus V2 is equal to zero. So V2, is equal to 30. So we know 30 volts. So we know our V2. So now that we know V2, then we can equate V2 in equation three, okay? So let's uh, put V2 into three. So V2 is 30, so that's minus 30 plus V3 plus Vs is equal to zero. Now you see, we have been able to reduce the total number of variables in the third equation to just two, and our interest here is Vs, okay? So Vs here is the same as 30 minus V3, okay? So let's call this our 40 equation. Good. Now, you see that at this node, let's say this is node one, node two, node three. So at node two, let's look at, at let's say, um, KCL at node two. Let's take KCL at node two. So KCL at node two. See that the total current flowing in through the node, I into the node, must be the same as the current out, right? So I1 flows in. Now, I2 and I3 flows out, so what do we? I2 plus I3. Now we know I1 is five ampere. This I1 here is five ampere. So that's five ampere is the same as I3 plus I2. Okay. 
Now, if we're able to tell I2, then by Ohm's law, we'll be able to get V2. So once we're able to get V2, or better still, here in our case, V3 we are looking out for. So once we're able to get I3, then we'll get V3. So once we substitute that in here, we'll get our Vs. It's that simple. Okay. So. So I3 now is the same as five minus I2. So let's call this our equation five. So, we already know V2, yeah, we already know V2. So now that we know V2 already, we could tell I2 by Ohm's law. So by Ohm's law, I2 is the same as V2 over 10 which is the resistor of 10 ohms. So this is 30 over 10, which gives us three ampere. So it means I2 is equal to three ampere. So if we put I2, now put I2 into equation five, so that will give us I3 for the five minus three, which gives us two ampere. So I3 is equal to two ampere. So by Ohm's law, by Ohm's law, V3, therefore, V3, therefore, is the same as I3 times 4, times the 4 ohms, which is the same as 2 amp times 4. And that gives us V3 to be 8 volts. Perfect. So now, from equation four, we can resolve Vs. So from four, Vs is the same as 30 minus A, which is the same as 22 volts. That's enough. Okay. And uh, no matter how complex the circuit is, you know, all you need to know is uh, to figure out the node or the loop. You may want to apply your KCL or KVL, then uh, where to apply. At what point do you apply Ohm's law? And, you know, uh, you're able to walk through it. And don't forget, by designating your current and voltages and then developing the system of equations, you are able to resolve the circuit no matter how complex. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Now let us let us look at a few examples uh, in terms of now that we understand KCL, KVL, Ohm's law. Let us apply them in evaluating the VI characteristics of a few circuits. Okay. So let us look at the first circuit. Let's assume you have a circuit like this. So say so you have four ohms here, you have three ohms here, then you have current flowing into it here, then uh, designate the voltage V. Okay. Now, this is an open loop, right? Meaning four ohms, three ohms are connected in series. So this is equivalent to the second plus minus V 
the current i flows through. Then r equivalent here is the same as three plus four, which is equal to seven ohms. So from here, by Ohm's law, Ohm's law, V is equal to IR, which is seven, and then I is equal to V over seven. Remember, in element law, you must specify the current and the voltage relationship, okay? And yeah, we did this before uh, from a previous example, you know, this is going to pass through the origin, right? Where we had to plot a few values. So let's not uh, overlabel ourselves on that. And we know uh, the slope is equal to one over seven. Slope is one over R, which is one over seven. It's one over seven. Now let us look at another circuit, say, so this is four ohms, this is three ohms. Okay. And this is I, and this is plus or minus V. So this now is equivalent to the circuit plus minus V. This is I here. Then uh, four ohm resistor is in parallel the three ohm resistor because you see at this point these two elements have a common node okay so meaning that they're, they're parallel so so that's another way of saying one over four plus one over three which is the same as uh, three times four over three plus four and that will give us 12 over seven, right? Now, V is the same as I dot 12 over seven. And I is the same as seven over 12 V. Now here we do not have any intercept. It's just a straight line that passes through the origin from our previous plot. Now, don't forget this is I. And this is V, very important, okay? And this is I, and this is V. And then the slope is seven over 12. Okay, perfect. Now we already uh, showed an example with the current source, voltage source. So let us take another simple example. Say we have a resistor here connected. Okay. A voltage source. This is plus or minus V. Current flows in through this. Then we have five ohms. Yeah. And here we have two volts. So here we want to apply KVL. It's a loop with a source. Okay. So KVL. If we apply KVL, so in this loop, so the direction goes in, goes in from the negative, that is negative V. So this is plus minus, right? That will be plus I dot five, right? Then it goes into the positive terminal here. That will be plus two. Plus two is a body so. So it means that five I is the same as uh, V minus two. Then I is the same as V minus two over five 
such that i is the same as v over five minus two over five, right? Okay. Now, in the same way, from this, v is the same as five i plus two. Remember, we mentioned that once you specify the current, then you must specify the voltage, 5i plus 2. So these are the two systems of equations that will be used to design the IV characteristic. And now you see that we have an intercept, meaning the relationship between the current and voltage is going to move off the uh, origin and have an intercept at minus two over five on the i-axis and another intercept at two on Yeah, on the B axis. So, so this is what we have. This is what we have. Let me come plus this now. This is I and this is V. So let's assume where well, uh, lines are plotted. So say this is, uh, for instance, this I axis, this is minus two over five. And on the V axis, let's say this is two, for instance. So it means that the graph goes through these two points and goes all the way. So we have a straight line passing through all the way. Yeah, and then the slope is one over five. One over five. One over five. Okay. Well, it's a straight line, it's not a bent line, please. <laughs> okay, let us look at the final example. So let's assume we have a circuit like this. Current direction goes this way. Then we have something like this. This is cross minus is V. Then the current flows in this way. Okay, let's let's forget about the direction thing. Let's just put on the direction. This is four ohms. This is five ohms. This is two ohms. So I uh, want to represent this using the equivalent circuits. So we have just one element representing the resistor and all of that. Now we know following the current direction here, current from the source or from some source not connected comes in through this, and it comes in through this direction. So I'm getting to this node. Definitely, we definitely know that it's going to split, right? Yeah, so it means that four ohm resistor and five ohm resistor are in parallel. So we can represent this equation with an equivalent resistor connected with the current source. So, and here we have four is in parallel with five. So that's going to give us four times five divided by four plus five, that's 20 over nine, right? So this is about 20 over nine. So plus minus the voltage. Okay, so now we can specify uh, what we have here. So. In this case, we know that current comes in through this. So let's say this is I1, I1, 
the current that flows in through this is I2. Okay, because the direction shows that it's flowing out. Now, if it were flowing in, then it would be negative of I2. Okay, and yeah, same direction. So we just maintain that direction. So here we have a common node. So we apply our node law, which is KCL. KCL, which is the current flowing in is the same as the sum of the current flowing out. That's I1 plus I2. That's I1 plus I2. Mm -hmm. But we know I1 by Ohm's law. So by Ohm's law, I1 is uh, V, V divided by 20 over nine. Okay. So that I now will be V over 20 over nine plus I two, which is two ohms. Okay. So this is going to give us nine over 20 V plus two. So if I is equal to nine over 20 V plus two, then V will be I minus two, right? Divided by nine over 20, which will be 20 over nine to bracket I minus two, right? So V now will be 20 over nine I minus 40 over nine. So these are the two equations. So we'll plot our IV characteristic. It means that the I have an intercept at point two. Let's say this is two, that's positive two, right? Positive two. While uh, the V axis have an intercept, say, at negative 40 over 9. OK? So we have a straight line going this way. And then the slope is the same as 9 over 20. Well, I think uh, this is a good place to stop. For now, because we've got, uh, we just try to push out a lot of information all at once, you know, to the build up the background for the study. So, in subsequent lecture series, we'll uh, probably be talking about some other interesting concepts like the node analysis, mesh, and all of that. You'll get to storage elements and a couple of things, you know, but. Uh, it will even become more interesting when you begin to see how well you are able to play with Ohm's law and the Kirchhoff's laws, the Kirchhoff current law, and Kirchhoff's voltage law, in terms of you know resolving a whole bunch of stuff. And then uh, the idea is you are able to see different ways in solving the same thing, you know. So just more like um, developing the problem solving abilities. In I think, um, I hope you enjoy the series and then hope to see you some other time.